So before we get into the ramifications of the Osmond dialogue over the weekend, let's just start on your reflections on John Howard's comments that Hong Kong's protesters are inspirational, because that's also been reported on. Big speech this uh, this afternoon where John Howard, the former Prime Minister, he's lauding these protesters and talking about the authoritarian way that China is uh, essentially the government is running now. Caitlin? It's a really interesting season of discontent in Hong Kong and I think they have quite fascinating comments to come from John Howard today. I think everyone's watching these protests so carefully really not knowing where they're going and, and how China may respond. And we know that China has been much more assertive in talking about uh, its response lately and also thinking about uh, the role that it plays in maintaining stability uh, in the region. So, look, Hong Kong is, is really demonstrating the, the, the precious place that democracy holds for the people there. And I think that's certainly a sentiment worth supporting. Erin, I'd love to get your reflections on this. John Howard is a, a Liberal leader of many years, a, a Liberal Prime Minister that I know is highly respected in the coalition. His comments essentially talking about a strong ties with the US and really gently rebuking Beijing in many ways. I mean, I don't know if gentle is even the right word because authoritarian is a strong word that he used. What did you make of his comments, Erin? Look, I don't think it's really surprising at all that John Howard has come out and made these comments. And I think that at the end of the day, it goes back to those base values and principles of someone like John Howard and, you know, and supporting Hong Kong. And I think that this is an important time because um, this is starting to spill over into Australia as well, as we've seen play out on university campuses over the last week or so, um, if not longer. So it is because I think it's right that he might have said something. Thing. Um, how strong or otherwise his views are uh, is probably comes from those core values and principles that he has as someone who did lead the Liberal Party. Let's talk about those uh, weekend talks. Caitlin, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo made several provocative declarations this weekend, including the warning that the world has been asleep at the switch when it comes to China. Now, given Australia has a very nuanced foreign policy when it comes to China, is it problematic that he made these remarks while sharing the stage with our foreign minister? Has Australia been really also participating in this rebuke of China? Oh, I think this was a full agenda, the Australia-US ministerial talks. It was really interesting um, to see Mike Pompeo come out onto the stage. And, you know, he, he came across as a very affable, likeable guy. I thought it was quite interesting to see him perform on the stage. But he had a very hard-headed message, a, a very distinct message, one that, firstly, America is going nowhere. Uh, America is a Pacific nation and is here in the Asia-Pacific to stay. Uh, secondly, that the alliance is particularly in important, the alliance between Australia and the US, as well as the number of alliances right across the region. And thirdly, I think there was a message that Australia has done quite a bit in recent months, particularly stepping up in the Pacific, but that there would be more of a, sp a step up expected of Australia in time to come. And I think that those three messages were delivered in fairly soft and, and uh, affable terms, but they were certainly had quite a sharp edge to them. Erin, after the meeting, US Secretary of Defence Mark Esper ramped up his rhetoric against China, accusing Beijing of engaging in a disturbing pattern of aggressive behaviour, destabilising behaviour in the region. Does this sort of assessment put Australia in an awkward position? We have been trying to walk, well, if I can be blunt, two sides of the streets at some point, uh, you know, trying to maintain this trade relationship and these strong relationships, but at the same time, uh, maintaining this US alliance, does this put us in a difficult position? We have, and I think that we have been doing this quite well, particularly up until recently. Um, but what I do want to say here is it's not like these ministerial meetings have taken place and it's the first time comments such as this have been made. Uh, Pompeo's comments have been delivered in many forums around the world recently. I remember reading a transcript in uh, from a press uh, conference that he had in 
Santiago a couple of months ago and it was a very similar line. So the idea or the notion that this is something that we're only hearing in Australia or is a message that was specifically written for Australia I think is um, wrong. So it goes back to that notion of also dialing it down a little bit and it's very easy I think in the, in, you know, for us who are out there in the media or writing about it to jump on these but this is quite a consistent message from the United States that we've been hearing for some time now. It does put um, Australia in a difficult position because we do have a different relationship with China to what the US has with China right now where the US and China have a strategic competition and some people are calling this the you know the new Cold War with economic characteristics. That is not the nature of our relationship with China. We have an excellent trade relationship with China, we have really strong people to people links with China and at the same time we have a security alliance with the United States. So our relationship is fundamentally different. Caitlin, what do you make of the uh, Chinese response to these meetings and the, the rhetoric and really the, uh, the kind of language that's being used which is quite inflammatory? I think we will see responses from China and China's media, but I think at the end of the day it comes back to how the officials, uh, how dialogue is maintained between officials. And I think, as Erin said, there's just so much more complexity to Australia's relationship with China. And we can't lose sight of that, you know, between institutions, between people. Um, there's an enormous amount of complexity here. And, and so, you know, we we can expect that there will be rhetoric coming from the Chinese media. I think that's fairly natural. Um, we have to look beyond that and we've got to really look at, at behaviours. And I think also we have seen a concerted effort um, both between China and Australia to reset the relationship, to ramp it up, uh, to think about different ways where we can explore those opportunities for us to find commonalities rather than focusing on the difference. But I think it's, it's fairly clear that there would be uh, uh, some rhetoric coming out of China as a result of the Australia-US meetings, you know, that I'm not surprised by that and I think we need to look beyond it. Erin, Defence Minister Linda Reynolds ruled out the idea of mid-range American missiles being hosted on Australian soil and then of course the Prime Minister backed her up and he used very strong language to say, nope, haven't been asked, not going to go there. It was like the government was just trying to absolutely put this story away. What do you make of the rejection and the enthusiasm of the rejection? Oh, I mean, it, it, I, think it, I think the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister have done the absolute right thing by saying, you know, we're just going to put a line in the sand. What they don't want is for us to be talking about this. They're saying, no, actually, dial it down, calm down. Um, again, it's been quite hyped up. So I think that they have done the right thing, but unfortunately, in another way, it means that we're all talking about it. So um, whether or not you know they should have gone out so strongly is another question. Perhaps it would have just gone away. But if if you know if they'd been silent, then we'd all be concerned about having mid-range ballistic missiles in Australia. So look, I think they did the right thing, uh, but it still hasn't quite dialed it down in the same way they might have intended it to. No, Caitlin, it, has it been dialed down? I mean, obviously the government said, okay, we don't want to pursue this, and we weren't asked. But is there room for change here or in the region? Is this still on the table? What's your analysis of how this still may look in the future? Because clearly this was a live issue. Maybe the US didn't. I mean, the government says they weren't asked, but clearly this was on the table. Well, I think it also comes out of the withdrawal of the US from the INF Treaty, which is all about those intermediate nuclear missile forces. Um, and so it's, that in itself has opened up the question about whether the US might consider um, placing missiles around in the region. And Australia, you know, is, is clearly going to be in the mix when that's being discussed and, and considered. I would agree with Erin. Again, I think the Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence did the right thing in really trying to, to, to dampen down this conversation. I mean, any kind of decision or any consideration of this sort of an issue would have to go through some fairly in-depth kind of, kind of consultations. Australia wouldn't take this kind of move lightly uh, or, or even be, be thinking about this kind of a situation uh, in the current climate. So I think that, that you know, we, we're going to have to wait this one out. Um, but it has been raised in the context of broader international moves coming out of the 
withdrawal from the INF Treaty by the US. And Erin, is this the beginning of an arms race potentially between China and the US? Even if Australia takes itself out of the equation, this is, this is an explosive issue potentially. Oh, I like your analogy there that it's explosive. Um, <laughs> Did you like that? <laughs> I like your pun. Well, I, um, I don't mind a pun, but yes. <laughs> uh, look, uh, potentially, but I think that this is exactly what the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister were trying to avoid, us having conversations like, is this, you know, a new arms race between these two uh, great powers? So, um, look, I'm, I'm not an expert on that and I wouldn't profess to be, but I think this is exactly what they were trying to avoid in that type of diplomacy, was this speculation about what might actually be happening here or what might happen in the future. But what I would say as well is that I definitely think that this can open up the conversation in the future because the Prime Minister said, we have not been asked. This is not a request that's been made of us. Now, what happens if that request is made? And that's an interesting conversation to be had. Let's move on to the other big issue where there has been very much a request. And in fact, that request is being considered actively by the government. And that's on the Persian Gulf and our potential involvement there in an international effort. I'll start with you, Caitlin. Would that be mm. wise? Should Australia participate in such an effort? I know Bob Carr, for, former foreign minister, is warning that perhaps uh, it, well, it doesn't come. It comes with some risks, of course, in, in terms of what's motivating the United States's interest here. Oh, absolutely. And there's never an easy answer to these things. And multiple perspectives need to be taken into consideration. I think Australia has certainly um, reflected on the fact that we we place enormous value on freedom of navigation, for example, and keeping sea lanes of communication open. Uh, that's in the foreign policy white paper. It's something that, that we've been really active in advocating for on the international stage for a long time. And some of this issue relates to maintaining freedom of navigation, ma making sure our trade lines are, are open and, and that we have access to the sorts of materials and goods that we need to have access to and that we we can move things around freely. On the other hand, I think, you know, these kinds of decisions bring enormous risk with them as well. We've just announced our focus is in the Pacific. And, and whilst we have an Indo-Pacific view, I think Australia is a, is a country that has to think very, very carefully about where it places its military focus and how it does that. One of the things I think is important in, in this particular issue is that we don't know what the nature of the request might be. And a whole lot of nations are likely to be asked to contribute to some kind of um, combined sort of effort. What that effort might look like on the part of Australia is as yet unknown. But I think at the moment we have to be careful that we're not muddying the waters and that we are maintaining a focus where we've said our focus will be. And that's very much in our near neighbourhood and in the Pacific. Aaron, the Prime mm. Minister says he wants to de-escalate tensions. Is there a risk a coalition would essentially escalate the situation? Yeah, look, I think that one thing that Australians wouldn't want to see is any further conflict in the Middle East and that stability is incredibly important in that region. Noting that um, something like three quarters of the oil that does come through that region ju does end up in energy hungry countries in uh, the um, in what we you know, might call Asia Pacific. But going to Caitlin's point about the Indo-Pacific, I'm sitting out here on the coast of Western Australia. Uh, this region's only nine hours away on a plane. It might mm. be a lot further from the southeast coast of Australia where we're right on the Pacific, um, but we can't look at the Pacific uh, at the detriment to the Indo side of this region that the government has now outlined in successive foreign policy white papers and defence white papers. So we can't simply look at the Pacific. That is important and the step up is important. But at the same time, there is the Indo region as well, which um, depending on how you define it, would also encapsulate this region in the Gulf. So um, stability is going to be very important out there. It would be politically very unpopular in Australia, I think. We certainly wouldn't want to be entering in any new conflicts out in that region. But I do want to emphasise that, yes, while we do have an Indo-Pacific strategy, we need to be looking at the Indo side as well. The Indo side. There's, a, there's many sides uh, to the globe. But let's, let's just end on something which has been a big story today on the ABC. I'll start with you, Caitlin. Labor mm. MP Nick Champion has become really the first federal politician to call for the controversial Chinese lease on the Darwin port to be scrapped so it can be placed back in Australia. Australian control, so essentially government control is what he's calling for. 
couple of questions on this. I'm going to give you okay. a couple. What are the prospects of that happening and do you think there's a case that it should happen? It's revisiting an issue that's been controversial in the past, but do you think now there is a case? Look, I think in, when, when we're dealing with these kinds of issues and issues around national assets and st assets of strategic importance, it's always worthwhile revisiting decisions that have been made. Um, the world is changing so quickly at the moment. I think it's a big call on this particular issue, um, but I think it is something that, that has been raised over years. It, it came up again in 2017 through a committee, Senate in committee inquiry. Uh, and we saw some of the rules of, around the Foreign Investment Review Board adjusted to um, take into account that decision making. I think it also flags for us that state and territories and the federal government need to talk really carefully and closely about the kinds of decisions they're making that have strategic implications for Australia going forward. Now, having said that, you know, we've got to be really careful that, that we're not playing into um, a narrative around China that is unhelpful to Australia. We want to see China in the region. We want to see China succeed in the region. But we also have to think very carefully about our national interests and our strategic assets and how we make decisions around the ownership of those. So, look, I think it, it, these sorts of debates are always worthwhile having and always worthwhile revisiting in an informed way. Um, we have to be careful it doesn't spin out of control through various media outlets, uh, you know, and that, and that we're able to have a really sensible conversation around it. And it's a conversation worth having. Erin, do you think Nick Champion has a point, the Labor MP, who's actually the deputy chair of this committee mm. that looks at these issues, does, does he have a case? That's correct. So I don't think that we can brush aside what he says entirely. He does have an important role. I think everything that Caitlin has just said is absolutely correct. The layer I would add on to that is around, I guess, political strategy. And I think that making that announcement the week of Osmin was not the time perhaps to do it. You might do it at a time where uh, perhaps there's less conversation around Australia's relationships with other great powers. So mm. I think that we should listen. And again, everything Caitlin has said is correct. But perhaps the timing wasn't 100% right because now it does feed into that narrative, the US versus China, and we've got to choose one, which is just not right. Um, so it's not helpful for what he's trying to achieve, which might have some validity. Just quickly on a story that's running in the, the Nine Press today, First Lady Melania Trump is reportedly pushing Donald Trump to make his first presidential mm -hmm. visit to Australia this year. How significant would this visit be? if it's pulled off, and I found it kind of interesting. I'd love your view on this, Caitlin. Why is Melania Trump so keen to get down under? I don't know. Maybe because we're the lifestyle superpower of the world. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure, but I think, you know, that would be a very significant visit. We haven't seen a US leader here since Obama was here in 2014 for the G20. Um, so it's a big call. I, I'm not sure, you know, I think it's... Uh, unclear whether Trump will accept the invitation, except that uh, it's all about golf. So, you know, mm. if there's going to be anything that might attract him to Australia, it could well be golf. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. Erin? Uh, look, as Caitlin said, really significant. But um, if you've ever been to Melbourne around December, which I think is when Trump has mm. said that his calendar's relatively clear. It's a glorious time to be in that city. So I'm not surprised Melania is interested in coming down under to Australia. Okay. If they'd like to come, they should also come across to Perth. Very important. <laughs> I do love how you manage to <laughs> weave Perth into everything. It is, uh, you are very much an advocate for your city and state. Thank you to both of you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, PK. Professor Caitlin Byrne from Griffith University and Perth US Asia Centre Head of Programs, Erin Watson-Lynn.